This morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, the trumpet is sounding and no one is alarmed. The trumpet is sounding and no one is alarmed. I want you to open your Bible to the book of Amos, and I'm going to be speaking out of chapters 3 through 5, the prophecy of Amos. Just leave it. Don't try to race down looking to where I'm going. You won't know. Just leave it open on your lap and I'll refer you to the scriptures as, as we proceed. Now, Father, I told you and I've reminded you time and time again, I'll preach anything you ask me to preach. I will encourage. I'll preach grace and mercy and we've done that. But Lord, I told you I would prophesy and speak only as you speak to my heart, only as you give it to me. And Lord, you've given me this word, and I, I come humbly to your throne and before this people, and let me be just an oracle. Just speak through me. Sanctify this vessel completely, so that every word comes out of it will be touched by the hand of God. It'll be something directly from the throne of God. Lord, you said you, you would never judge until you speak to your prophets. But Lord, you also speak to your watchmen. And I'm a watchman and you've spoken my heart. And we bring, we bring the prophecy of Amos. And yet in this prophecy, we hear the word for our own hearts and our own nation and our church today. So, oh God, when we hear the trumpet this morning, let us hear the alarm. Let us feel the concern of God's own heart. Lord, we pray that everyone that's come here this morning, those in the overflow rooms, those who are hearing and watching on jumbo screens, we pray, Lord, that the word would be as powerful as it is in this auditorium, that they will hear through a spiritual ear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Amos is, of all the Old Testament prophets, uh, most clearly speaking, he speaks most clearly to our generation. Of all... The Old Testament prophets, Amos zeroes in, and what you hear him prophesy to his generation is a dual prophecy that is applied today. And when you hear his prophecy, it sounds like he has just read today's newspapers. He was into the New York Times, and he has heard the reports, and he's speaking as God has directed him. And in Amos, he, he sees, the prophet sees God as a lion Roaring. A lion doesn't roar until he has his prey in sight. And just as he's ready to pounce, he'll give a roar. And he, he said God is roaring as a lion, ready to strike judgment on a backslidden nation in a church. And in Amos 3, verse 8, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? He said, I, I hear a trumpet and I hear a roar from the Lion of Judah. And he said, I have to speak. He said, when you hear that roar, you have to speak. And folks, I've heard that roar and I have to speak. God revealed to Amos that he was blaring a trumpet sound in effort to try to awaken his church, to awaken his people. Surely, chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He reveals His secrets unto His servants, the prophets. Never in history has God judged a nation or a church without first raising up voices, prophetic voices. God said, I won't do that. I owe it to my people. I owe it to my people, and I, I will do it for the nation. I will not judge you. I will not pour out my awesome judgments until I warn you. And that's what the prophet Amos is doing. He sees the judgments rolling down. He sees the storm gathering. And he said, I have to speak. Amos 3, 6. Shall the trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? He said, God is rising like a roaring lion now, ready to take the prey. God sounded a trumpet and he said, nobody seems to be alarmed. Nobody seems to be listening. Folks, people don't want to hear anything of judgment now. They don't want to hear anything of any gloom or doom because there's so much fear in the land, so much expectation of terrorist attacks and so many other things that are bearing down on our society and especially the economic outlook at present. And so people say, I, I just can't handle it anymore. 
But folks, you see, we have to hear it because the Holy Ghost gives us power to handle it, so to speak. He gives us the endurance and He prepares us. He prepares us in the warnings that He speaks through His servants. Now, this is not a warning to the heathen nations alone. Now, surely the Gentile nations around Israel at the time of Amos were going to have judgment fall upon it. They were stealing the borders of Israel. They were terrorizing Jerusalem and Judah and Israel at the time, especially killing little children. And it sounds very familiar to what is happening today. And the prophet said to these nations surrounding Israel, you're going to pay a price. There's a trumpet been sounded. And here's what he said, fiery judgments are going to come con Hazel. That was one of the bordering uh, city nations. Gaza will be ruined. Tyrus is going to be punished. There will be punishment upon Edom. Fire is going to fall upon Teman and Reba. All of these surrounding nations of Israel, he said, you have touched the borders of my people. You, you have terrorized my people. He said, no, I'm going to judge you for it. The scripture, by the way, the scripture says in Zechariah 12, 2 and 3, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about them. And when they shall be in siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. In other words, when these nations rise up against Jerusalem. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. And that burden, and they that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the earth be gathered against it. Folks, worldwide now there's anti-Semitism rising. All through Europe, all over the world, and even now in the United States, even from Protestant evangelical pulpits. But the Bible says, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. God will defend. But Amos directs his, pro his prophecies primarily to the church of Jesus Christ. To the church of God of that time. Chapter 3, verse 1. Hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. This roaring of the lion was made against God's own family that had become corrupted in worship. Ch chapter 3, verse 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore will I punish you for your iniquities. Now folks, listen very closely to what I'm about to tell you. Give me your good ear, listen closely. This is a law, a divine law. And that divine law says this, the greater the measure of grace upon a people, the greater the judgment and punishment if it is despised or rejected. A nation that's given grace, a people that's given grace and mercy, a people that's given light and much gospel truth, he said, I expect more of you. And if you despise and reject it or you corrupt it, your judgment will be double. Surely God is even now judging America for its wickedness and its rejection of God's name. We have been taught, I've been taught as a child from, from childhood that America was founded by godly ministers, by a godly people trying to find a place where they were free just to worship the Lord. That's what I learned all my lifetime. America was a chosen nation because godly men came to this nation. Well, the same is boasted in South Africa. The Afrikaans who moved into South Africa and there was a civil war and they claimed that this was freedom to worship. And there are other nations all over the world claiming to be chosen in the very same thing. No doubt God has blessed certain nations like America in its infancy. This was the greatest missionary sending church on the face of the earth. We sent missionaries all over the world. And there were godly preachers and evangelists that held back the flood tides of evil because they were men of prayer. There were congregations that held back the flood tides of iniquity. But you see, the nation became pleasure mad and we turned to the idols of sports and we turned to the idols of riches and prosperity. There was a backsliding among the people and our worship became corrupted and the flood tide of iniquity poured in 
And now we are no longer the great missionary sending church. We're the Coca-Cola sending nation. And we're sending false doctrines all over the world. The missionaries that go out often are those that have set out a corrupted message and a corrupted gospel. And see, God, still loving these nations, it's not just the United States. You see it happening all over the world now. And because of His love and because He wants to restore what has been lost, He sends judgments to purge the nation. There will be floods and droughts and drastic weather changes and hurricanes and tornadoes. And I get totally exasperated by preachers, pastors and evangelists that get up before the people and they say, God isn't behind the floods. He's not behind the droughts. He's not behind the tornadoes. He's not behind the hurricanes. That's the devil. Well, then they don't know their Bibles. They have no concept of God's nature. Let me prove it to you. Go to the fourth chapter of Amos. Let's start at verse 6. Amos 4, 6. And I, who I, God, also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and the water bread in all your places. That's an economic collapse. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withhold the rain from you. Who withholds the rain? When there were yet three months to the harvest, I caused it to rain one city upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the piece upon it rained not withered. Now, folks, do you see this happening right now? Right now, while Florida is being flooded and other nations, other cities and states are being flooded, the northwest is in a drought. And you see it raining one part and drought. There's a hurricane over here. There's a tornado over here in verse 8. So two or three cities wandered, from, uh, wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. You see, God is saying, return to me. I'm sending these chastisements to purge your nation, to bring you back to me. It was done in mercy and grace. Verse 9, I've smitten you. Who's smitten you? I, God has smitten you with blasting and mildew. By the way, mildew, have you been reading your newspapers about mildew? When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet have we not returned, you've not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And now we have the Japanese beetle in Central Park killing our trees and thousands of acres by all kinds of incredible, exotic, new worms and beetles and bugs. Palmer worm has devoured them, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Now, do you understand those ten plagues of Egypt, including drought and storms and thunder that shook the shook the earth itself and lightning that rolled along the ground and incredible things your young man have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses and I've made the stink of your camps to come up unto your own nostrils yet you have not returned unto me saith the Lord oh, folks all through the Bible it's there God in his mercy calling nations and church the church back to himself now, in verse 9, and by the way, folks, Amos saw God coming in a dual judgment on the nation and simultaneously on the church. The Bible says judgment begins in the house of God. Now listen closely as I proceed. Amos prophesied of a dual judgment on the nation simultaneous with judgment on the church. Upon the nation, verse 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, a great tumult in the midst of thee, or thereof. A great tumult in the midst thereof. Now, that tumult means, in Hebrew, a state of confusion 
everything turned into disarray by attacks of violence and terror. Now, does that sound familiar to you? A tumult in the midst of the, a tumult. Terror, attacks of terror, when everything goes into disarray and disorder. What about the disarray now in business in the United States? Now, the prophet Amos said, called them palaces. He said disorder in the palaces. In fact, he said there's going to be robbery in your palaces. Robbery. And palaces mean citadels, strongholds. We would call them big business. We would call these our institutions upon which we have trusted, in which we've trusted institutions, big business, General Motors, for example, Ford and General Electric and all of these great institutions. And he said there's going to be robbery in their palaces. Think of the CEOs now of corporations that cook their books, rob their own stockholders, hundreds of thousands being thrown into unemployment because of theft, bankrupting their own company so they can have a golden parachute and escape to some island they buy and sit there in their wealth and their riches while they send people out to poverty. And all this has been prophesied by Amos. He said, robbery in your palaces, robbery in your citadels. In verse 11, an adversary, there shall be even round about the land. He shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. And what he's saying, there's going to be attack on all sides. The enemy will hurl and cast down your crowns of splendor and your might. Those great institutions and these great symbols of power that you've been glorying in. He said it's all going to go bankrupt. He said the citadels are coming down. And folks, we've seen, we've seen the striking of our twin towers, symbol of our great Wall Street and our prosperity and the attack on the Pentagon, a symbol of our power and our might. And it's been well prophesied in the Word of God. God said, I'll bring down your strength. I'll bring down your citadels. There'll be robbery in your great houses. And we see it coming to pass day by day before our very eyes. And here's one of the most dire warnings of all. Namus is speaking on behalf of God. He said, while there's fear on all sides, coast to coast, adversaries terrorizing all nations, destroying even the buildings representing power and glory, he said, this is going to be followed by the appearance of a financial lion coming to devour the wealth and the properties of those who got rich by theft and robbery. But I'll tell you, there's an amazing verse, Hosea 5.12. Look at uh, uh, Amos. I'm sorry. It, uh, it's in verse chapter 3, rather. 3.12. Amos 3.12. First of all, in verse 11, and what we'll go to Tim, for they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence or robbery in their palaces. They store up violence and robbery or theft in their high places. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, an adversary there shall an adversary there shall be even round about the land, shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. Thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear. So shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed in Damascus in the council. And what he's saying, these are all types and symbols. And he's talking to the rich and the wealthy who have just been guilty of robbery. And he said, as a shepherd goes and the, the lion has destroyed a, a sheep and he pulls out all that's left as a bone. 
All that's left is a bone or a piece of an ear. And what the prophet is telling them, all of these you thought they were going to be so secure. They're going to have their millions of dollars and they're going to be secure. Let the rest of the world do what they have to do, but I got mine. But the prophet said, the time is coming that there's going to be a devouring lion, devour your wealth, devour everything you have, and all you're going to have left is a bone. All you're going to have is a piece of your wealth, an ear. He said, I'm going to devour it from you. There's a picture in yesterday's paper, New York uh, Daily News, I believe it was, picture of the president, I believe it's of Worldcom, that's going bankrupt. And he's on his yacht, having a great time. And he's out on bail. And you look at that yacht and the mansion behind it, and then you hear the prophet Amos said, it's all going to be devoured. And all you're going to have left is a bone, a shin bone. Amazing prophecy from Amos. While God is visiting his judgment on nations, God said he's also going to visit the church. Now go to chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. That in the day... Let's start verse 13. Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob. Now, the house of Jacob is the church. This, this is the house of God. Saith the Lord of hosts, the God of hosts, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar, now this is, I'll show you what this means, it's, it's awesome. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. He said, I, while I'm judging the nation, I'm going to visit Bethel. Now look at me please. This is very important that you get it and understand it. The house of Jacob clearly represents the church. He said, all who forsake the Lord and who turn to godless pleasure and debauchery are going to be humbled and brought low. Yes, he's going to judge the nations just like America. But his greatest concern is the church, his kingdom on earth. Those that are called by his own name, or at least boast that they're called by his name. God's greatest concern in this last hour is his church. He said, of all the people on the earth, you're my family. You're my concern. Folks, I want to tell you something. Don't get out of kilter. Don't get upset because the agnostics and the atheists are trying to take God out of the pledge to the American flag. Don't blow a gasket because they now want to take in God we trust off of our coins. Folks, they want to take the name of God out of our society. But don't get upset about it because God has already started to judge them. They are already under the judgment of God. God, God laughs at this kind of foolishness. Put me out of your society. That, 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 that means nothing to God compared to his concern for his people, his church. We are the ones that can hurt him. We are the ones that can grieve him. The nation is not grieving God like we, his people. Those call themselves by his name, his church. That's his greatest concern. He said, I'm going to visit Bethel. Bethel was where Jacob met God. That was where the ladder was stretched down from heaven. And that's a dreadful place. He called it. He said, this is a dreadful place, a place of reverence to a holy God. The place where he said is the gate of heaven. And Bethel's where the Bible says God came down and met man. Bethel represents not just a place, but a, 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 a spiritual condition. A spiritual place. And God kept sending Jacob back. Every time Jacob was discouraged, he said, go back to Bethel. 
It was a hallowed place. It represents a people who reference God. It represents a church where God's presence is there. There's a holy reverence. There's an awe for God. And God comes down and meets them at this place. He said, but I'm going to come down and I'm going to visit Bethel. Because you see, King Jeroboam, when he came to the throne after Solomon, he corrupted the worship at Baal, uh, at Bethel and at Dan. He took the lowest of the people. He, he, he took the criminal element. He took those who had no heart for God and made them the pastors. And he set up a house of worship to Baal. And he corrupted the altars that were at the altar that was erected at Bethel. He totally corrupted it. And from Jeroboam to the very day of Amos, it was a place that God despised. Because it was now a worship of mixture. It was exuberant. It was loud. It was colorful. But it was an abomination to God. And the reason for it was because the praise and the worship that was going up was corrupted. Ungodliness, sinfulness in the heart. I'm going someplace with this and I want you to follow me closely, please. Here's the clear word of God. At the same time, I judge your nation. When the world is trembling because of war and violence, and when I am sending floods and droughts and blasting and mildew, and when your economy is shaken and wealth is being devoured, at that same time I will visit my church with judgment for corrupting my worship. I will visit Bethel. I'm going to visit my church. The Bible says that what King Jeroboam did that Bethel became a sin, for the people went there to worship. And in Bethel they sacrificed unto a golden calf. And he made priest of the lowest of all the people. God judges false worship. There is a Bethel kind of worship now that's corrupting the whole world. It's corrupting the whole church of Jesus Christ worldwide. It's the same Bethel spirit. The prophet said, come to Bethel and transgress. In other words, there's a worship that people are so involved in and they think it's God. They think it's holy and the crowds are pouring in. And he said, keep going to Bethel. Go ahead. But he said, you're just multiplying. You're sinning. Your sins are multiplying. The more you think it's God, your eyes are closed. You're in a false worship. And he said, come on, on. keep up. All you're doing is multiplying your sins. Come to Bethel and transgress. Let me tell you why. Chapter 4, verse 5. And they offered a sacrifice of thanksgiving with what? And proclaim and publish the free offerings. And this liketh you. In other words, you love it. Oh, you children of Israel, saith the Lord God. Now listen to me, please. Leavened bread by the law was to be given only as a sacrifice to the priest. And he was to consume it the same day it was given to him. That was the place for leavened bread. But what they were doing when they brought the, the offering, the bread offering, was the thanksgiving and praise offering. And when they brought it to the altar at Bethel, and the fire was kindled, they were casting in unleavened, uh, un, they, uh, leavened bread. Leaven stands for sin, do you understand, in the Bible? for leprosy, for flesh. And he said, your praise offerings are full of leaven. He said, you praise and worship. Now folks, they, 
they thought they were worshiping Jehovah. Jehovah's name was used. They used the same language. They used the same forms. But he said, you offer your sacrifices. And he said to me, you offer your sacrifices to me with leaven. He said, the sacrifice of the Thanksgiving offering was to be unleavened cakes mingled with oil. That's the Holy Spirit. And cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil. The oil of the Holy Oil stands for the Holy Spirit. And I, I, you, you've got to see this. The Bible says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, and who's not lifted up his soul to vanity and sworn deceitfully. These people were very religious outside. They were very zealous, the scripture says. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes. It's right there in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4. He said every morning they were there. In fact, not only were they there every morning, but they were going to Gilgal and Beersheba. They were going from place to place for conferences, praise meetings, worship meetings. And they gathered by the thousands. Then Amos says, don't go to Gilgal, don't go to, to Bethel, don't go to Beersheba. He said, because God is going to bring it all down. Folks, we have praise meetings and sacrifices of praise being offered all over the world today. And if you don't know the Holy Ghost, if you've not been seeking God, and if you have sin that's unforsaken in your life, and you go to the house of God, now I'll, I'll bring it down closer if you come to Times Square Church. And the Holy Ghost has been dealing with you time after time about sin in your life. If he's been dealing with you about adultery, there's someone you have not forgiven. And you hold that grudge in spite of every gospel message you hear. Holy Ghost has dealt with you time and time again and you come and raise your hands and you praise God. You have leaven on your sacrifice and God will not accept it. He never has and never will. You're wasting your time and bringing judgment upon you. I'll show that to you. And there are great meetings all over the world now led by men who have never known God's heart who've never wept between the porch and the altar, who have been looking now for nothing but the almighty dollar and success. And you hear this sound. It's loud. It sounds joyful. It's colorful. Now, folks, I am not indicting every worship service and praise service. No, because all around the world, God now has a holy people. And there's a sound of a Niagara of praise and worship that's powerful. And people are weeping under it. People are getting saved under it. They're not thinking of the things of this world, the pleasures of the world, or success. They are brokenhearted before God. And there's a holy reverence. And out of that reverence, out of that intimacy with Jesus, comes a glorious shout of praise. But folks, be careful. Be careful, the prophet warns. If your church or your group has no gospel that exposes sin, if there's no smiting conviction of reproof, if there's no call to repentance and forsaking of all sin, you're at Bethel. And you're at a Bethel altar. And it's a sacrifice of leaven that God says, I will not accept. Now it gets worse. Amos 3.14 I will visit the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Now, folks, listen to it. When I was a boy, my father was a preacher, my grandfather. Every service you'd hear this. Oh, God, we're going to lay hold of the horns on the altar. Some would testify, 
I broke through and laid hold of the horns of the altar, and I'm safe in God. The altar, this, uh, the Old Testament had four horns on the four corners. They were made of wood and covered with brass in the shape of a ram's horn. And the, the, the whole meaning of the ram's horn was the right of sanctuary. It was protection. By laying hold of the horns and the altar, the offender then placed himself under the protection of the saving, keeping grace of God. You find that illustrated in First Kings, the second chapter, when David's son Adonijah uh, tried to usurp the throne of David and proclaims himself king. And, and David immediately anoints Solomon. And Solomon sends word out that Adonijah is a dead man for what he's done. Adonijah runs to the temple. He runs to the house of God and grabs hold of the horns of the altar. And he, he, he says, let King Solomon know that I'm holding the horn of the altar. And Solomon couldn't touch him. Solomon refused to touch him. He survived. Now, it was different with Joab because of the blood that was on his hands. But you see, even in the cities of refuge, they would run and... And if they were running, they couldn't get to the city of refuge, they would get to the house of God and they couldn't grab hold of the horns of the altar. It was security. It was protection. But God says at Bethel, where there's leaven, and these people are worshiping me with sin in their hearts that has never been dealt with. Can you imagine people who spend the evening in pornographic theaters then coming Sunday to the house of God and dancing and shouting and raising their hands people like a letter I got from an elder of a church that came to our conference pastor wouldn't come with him because he was mad at him wouldn't speak to him for two months. And the elder went to him, humbled himself. And reluctantly, the man partially forgave him. And that man standing in the pulpit. Let me tell you something. Everything that man says, every word of worship, every time he raises his hand, it's a stench in God's nostrils. And worse than that, there's no protection against deception. The horns of the altar are gone. He said, I will cut them off and they will fall to the ground. When there's not a pure worship, you fo folks, there have been people who have left this church because of various reasons. And, and a lot of people leave because we, we preach a strong message against iniquity. We preach grace. We preach mercy. That's prim primarily our message here. But there are times that God is thundering from this pulpit to all of us to lay hold of His covenant and be purged of those hidden things, secret things in our lives. He's done that. And he, He's purged and there's a son. A lot of people can't handle it and they go off and they say, oh, I, I'm in a place now, you, you ought to hear it, man. The flags are waving everywhere and people are dancing and what a shout. They're shouting and praising God. I'm not against flags. Folks, if your heart's pure, you can wave anything you want. Wave your handkerchief, wave anything. If you've got a pure heart, God will receive it. Hallelujah. I'm not against that. It's the heart. It's what's coming out of our mouth. From a pure, it, it, the Bible said, if you're corrupted at the spring, everything comes out of the spring is going to be corrupted. But you see, now God says, I will, I'm going to cut off the horn. I'm going to cut off your protection from deception. And folks, I have seen the awful results 
of the horns coming off the altar. I've seen what happens in Africa right now. Thousands are swarming in to one African nation into a city. And I won't name the nation of the city, but it was brought to me firsthand. There's a man now. In fact, people from the United States are flocking to hear because he claims that he was made a prophet in his mother's womb and that God prophesied and spoke words for the people while he was in the womb. And so now people are coming everywhere to get their word that was delivered way back in his mother's womb. And he's giving these words. He's giving these prophecies. Saying, I got this for you when I'm still in the womb. And they are flocking. Now that's unscriptural. It's blasphemy. But the walls are down. The horns are gone. The discernment is lost. And these people are flocking to it. Why? Because of sin. They have not laid hold of God. They don't have any intimacy with Jesus Christ. They're just looking for something exciting and new. Folks, I, we've warned from this pulpit, you want something exciting and new, get down alone with God in the secret closet of prayer. He'll give you every exciting, precious word that you'd ever need and receive. In one of the Balkan states now, there's a prophetess going around instructing the people to lay prostrate in the floor and release your mind to her. She used to be a witch. She had been in hell and back, she says, and she said, you've got to see hell before you can understand the gospel. And I'm going to take you to hell. And so everybody lays down and she takes them on a trip to hell. And some of them are going, they're absolutely losing their senses. They're tripping out and gone. And the pastor is told, no folks, I, where, where this has happened, I happen to have been in that church when they were starting to get into these new things, all these new things. And some of the godly elderly people in that church came to me and said, Pastor Dave, what's going on? There's a lot of noise and sound and new things, but it doesn't sound right. There's something wicked underneath. Because you see, you get into that the discernment's gone. There's no horns on the altar. There's no protection. Any, any false doctrine, any false shepherd, even a witch can keep come in and pose as a gospel preacher of Jesus Christ and deceive the whole congregation if they're not under discernment. In, in Brazil, there's an evangelist now getting rich. He guarantees healing for cancer for a thousand dollars. Your know, exorcism costs a little less, but he's got a great following now and getting rich and the people love it. It's unscriptural, it's blasphemy, it's deception because there are no horns on the altar. Here in the United States, we've become the worst pushers of deceptive gospels all over the world. American Christians are becoming scriptural illiterates. Say, I say it in love. There's biblical illiteracy. People don't know their Bibles anymore because they've been running around trying to get a thrill. Not willing to fast and pray and seek the face of God. They'd rather get on a plane and go to some exciting new thing. Folks, be careful. Be very, very careful. Because you may be going to Bethel. You may be worshiping at an altar that's about to come down. Amos cries out, You offer thanksgiving sacrifices to the Lord with leaven. Verse chapter 4, verse 5. And this liketh you. In other words, you love it. Oh, you children of Israel, saith the Lord. He said you love it. Folks, people love. People love it. They don't want, many people now, I'm not saying everybody, but there's so many Christians now, don't want to be probed. They don't want to be examined by the Holy Ghost or the Word. May that never happen in Times Square Church. 
The Bible says, and I'm going to close now, God tells us He's going to pass through His church. He's going to shut down all that is polluted. I wanted you to see it, chapter 5. Follow me now. Start verse 17. And in all vineyards, you know what the vineyards stand for, don't you? These are individual churches, individual congregations. And in all vineyards shall be wailing, and I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord will be darkness and not light. I want you to look at verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. <clears throat> Let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness is a mighty stream. Folks, look at me, please. It's very, very simple what the prophet's saying. This is what God is saying. Until righteousness comes down as a stream and cleanses everything in its way. Until you allow your heart to be open to that stream of righteousness through the covenant promises of God. He said, you're not giving me a true sacrifice of praise and worship. And God wants a pure worship in these last days. While iniquity abounds, God has to have a people that come together and give Him true praise and true worship. You can't measure the holiness, you can't measure the value or the purity of a praise service or a praise offering by how loud it is or how joyful it may sound. You say, well, how do you measure it? By the Bible said, by your the fruits, you shall know them. And the fruits of a true worship, according to Amos, is that you care for the poor and go out to meet the needs of the needy. It's not a message of success and prosperity. It's a message of a people who have come into the house of God having prayed and ministered to the poor and the needy in the land and in their midst. And he said, that's a test. He said, also, that you are grieved for the afflictions of Joseph. In other words, you're grieved at what you see happening to God's house. There's a grief in your heart. And you just... You cry about it. You, you weep over it and say, oh, God, have mercy, have mercy. Because, folks, many people that are in this are just blind. They're blind. Many new converts have got caught up into this kind of thing. And they've never had anybody tell them that what they were doing was sinful. They never opened the scripture and said, now, look, that's, not, that's contrary to the word of God. When we first came here and opened this church, we had people for broad, Broadway, people that were in Broadway shows, vile shows. And I remember preaching sermons called A Letter from the Devil was one of them. And, and a challenge we called said, look, this is wrong. You, you, you are in something that is evil. And, and God began to bring them out. And God began to cleanse. We had sitting in our congregation one a whole row of transvestites that came for quite a while until finally some dear people in this church said, you know, according to the scripture... There needs to be a change. And it was done lovingly, but it was pointed out so that they would not continue in that farce. And three or four of them immediately changed. And by the way, some of them are married and still in this church. I close with this good word, Amos 14, 5, 14 and 15. Amos 5, verse 14 and verse 15, seek good and not evil, that ye may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you, as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good, establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. He said, seek the Lord and live. Seek the Lord in God. First thing God gives you, seek it with all your heart. And you open up your heart 
to be judged by the Word of God and you're willing to forsake, confess and forsake your sin, first thing God's going to give you, He's going to baptize you with discernment. You're going to know. You're going to be able to smell it with your spiritual ears. You're going to see it with your spiritual eye. You'll hear with a spiritual ear. And you'll know immediately. And you can turn to your husband or wife when you're in the wrong place. Say, honey, let's get out of here. This is Bethel. You'll know it. Hallelujah. God is with his people. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me, please? Will you stand? Folks, I'm going to boast in the Lord. Everybody in the building, in the annex and overflow rooms, wherever you're at, I'm going to boast. Because there are people in this house. There's a ministry in this church that put themselves under the purging, cleansing fire of the Holy Ghost. There are horns at this altar. There are horns. There is protection. I boast in the Holy Ghost. I boast in what God has done through His Spirit in this house. Glory be to God. No leaven. The unleavened bread covered with oil. Wafers. Each one bringing a wafer dipped in oil. Bring it to the Father. Here, Jesus. I bring you this unleavened offering of praise and thanksgiving, sacrifice of praise, wholly acceptable unto God, wholly acceptable, because I've given myself. I haven't given you just an hour on Sunday morning or two. I've given you my heart. I've given you everything. Now, folks, the reason God brings a message like this is for the protection of His body. This message goes out on internet now around the world it goes out to hundreds of thousands on our mailing list it's a, a message that God is bringing forth to protect his people from all the false stuff that's coming down the road folks you can't b begin to believe what's coming do you know that people who are giving the Lord false praise and false worship with leaven they're going to be the first to recognize and accept the Antichrist you may not believe that. It's not going to be the agnostics and, and it's not going to be the atheists that accept them at first. It's going to be blinded, undiscerning believers or who call themselves believers who never were changed, never truly saved, never truly have known Him and have held to the world and held to its sins and its pleasures and nothing has changed except the words that come out of their mouth. Praise and worship has never been sanctified. And they're so blind, they'll be the first to accept the Antichrist. I believe that with everything in my heart. But thank God, I, I feel so secure in the hands of the Lord. Don't you? How many in this building now feel safer after you've heard the message? You feel safer than you've ever felt. That's because you, you've got... That's because you have your hands on the horn. One hand on this horn and one hand on this hand over here. Devil, you can't touch me. Deception, you can't touch me. I am laying hold of the horns on the altar. Glory be to God. Lord, anoint this to our ears, to our hearts. God, I pray that many, many that hear this will be delivered from deception. And they will begin to examine the place in which they worship. They will begin to examine it. They will pray before they go. They will pray before they enter the house of God. And they will look at the lives of their pastors and their teachers and those around them who, who, who claim to be spiritual. God, we've got to examine what we see. And Lord, and judge only righteously, not with condemnation, but with righteous judgment. Lord, protect this congregation. 
from all of the deceptions that are coming. Lord, terrible deceptions. The Antichrist is going to come and deceive the whole world. But, oh God, we recognize that Antichrist spirit. We see it, we discern it, and we deny it. Oh God, that spirit that's even at work in the church. God, we repel it through the power of the Holy Ghost. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's very vital before we close the service and before you walk out of here. If you know in your heart that the Lord has a controversy with you, and, and I'll tell you what, just as surely as He sends floods and droughts and mildew and all of these things, blasting and mildew, to wake up people, He will allow things in your life to go into total disorder, trying he said, I allowed this to happen, but you didn't come back. Then I allowed this to happen, or I brought this into your life, and you still didn't come back, you still didn't come back. Stop that today. God's been dealing with you, and I'm going to make it bold and outright in the <clears throat> annex and here in the main auditorium. If there is a controversy because of sin, and if you have sin in your life that has not been forsaken, now, now, folks, God's made covenant promises to give you the power over your sin. But if you're holding on to it and not allowing the Holy Spirit to deal with it, then you're in real danger. And I'm inviting you today to step out of your seat. Folks, please, only, I'm narrowing it down, only those that are here that you know in your heart, there's, there's, I can't offer... A sacrifice of praise and worship to the Lord until this is dealt with. There's something in our heart. Nobody needs to know it. Is it jealousy? Is it an unforgiving spirit? Is someone you haven't talked to or refused to talk to? God said, if you won't forgive others, He won't forgive you. Your sins are just piling up to heaven. Has it been unclean eyes? I don't know what it is. But if you know... You can't offer up a pure offering of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. I invite you to come for cleansing here at the front of this church. And we'll pray with you and believe God for a miracle. We're going to believe the Lord right now for a cleansing. We want to be able to lift our hands, holy hands, clean hands, a clean heart, a pure heart, with everything laid down before the eyes of the Lord. There has to that you have to come forward here and you step out not because of fear fear is not going to keep you because that fear will dissipate as soon as you get out the door if, if this message has just produced fear in your heart it's not you haven't received it in the right way this is not just about being afraid of going to hell or being damned it has to be something in your heart where you say I, I want to be free. I don't want to be bound anymore. I want to be free from this thing that holds me. I don't want to live in sin, and I don't want to be a slave anymore. I want to be free. There has to be a cry in your heart to be free, and also there has to be a cry in your heart to say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to be a half-hearted. I want to be, I want to give everything I am and all I have to you. I want to make a total sacrifice. And I want to learn to hate my sin. I don't want to hold on to it anymore like an idol. I want to see how ugly and sinful it is. And that's what the Bible said the law is supposed to do. It's to show you the exceeding sinfulness of your sin. And if you stand here now, you came forward and you say, I know what my sin is. My sin is not some little thing. My, this sin can damn and destroy my soul. This is out of hell. I don't want it. It's exceedingly sinful. And that's what you have to have in your heart. This hatred. And folks, if you don't have that hatred, you can ask God and He'll give that to you by covenant. I will cause you, he says, to walk in my ways. He said, I'll cause you to despise your sin. These are all clear promises in the Word of God. And he said, I'll cleanse you. And I'll sanctify you. And I'll make you clean. I want you to pray this out of your heart, from the depth of your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm tired of my sin. 
Now, I don't want to be a slave anymore. God, help me to hate my sin. And no more excuses. It has to go. And it has to go today. Lord Jesus, put that hatred in my heart. For all sin. Lord Jesus, I confess my sin. I bring it to you. And I bring it to your covenant. I ask you to forgive me. And now cleanse me. According to your promises. Oh Jesus. I repent. I tell you. I've sinned against you. Give me a new heart. Right now put a new heart in me. A heart that loves you. A heart that hates sin. A heart that can be drawn to you. Now, I want you to lift your hands. And I just want you in your own words to start loving Jesus and thanking Him that He has the power. And ask the Holy Ghost to give you power of your sin right now. Pray that. God, I answer that prayer right now. Jesus, I'm asking you to give me power over my sin. I'm asking you right now, Jesus, to give me that spiritual authority. I claim your promises. And will you love Jesus right now? Just love Him. Lord, I love you for being merciful to me. Lord, I want this to be the first day of a new beginning in my life. Break the chains of sin. Now, Lord, I come against the power of hell and darkness. I come against principalities and powers of darkness. I come against demon powers. I come against these evil spirits. And we bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness. We take the authority of Jesus Christ now over all the powers of iniquity. Over all the powers of hell and darkness. Break every chain that enslaves those who stand here. Pray it right now, Lord. Break every chain that binds me. Lord, break every chain. Break the chains that bind me. Break them and set me free right now. Hallelujah. Now, will you praise Him? Will you thank Him? Give Him thanks and give Him praise. This is the conclusion of the message.